In this lecture, we're going to look at theories of the exchange rate. But before we have to do that, we have to think about central banking. Central banking is key to exchange rate determination across um, both the span of economic history, which concerns the EC4024 module, but also uh, in current day um, in current day policy. So, if you're not familiar with what a central bank is, click that link up there, and you'll get a sense of uh, who, the history of central banking, where it came from. But really, there there are a couple of issues to talk about, and um, before we get started, the first is the notion of independence versus non-independence. Independence means independence of a central bank means legal independence. It means that Angela Merkel cannot compel Jens Wiedemann to increase the interest rate uh, uh, that is set by the Bundesbank because she feels like it, or because that today is, is is Thursday or whatever. She can't do that. Okay. Um, some central banks are most central banks are independent now in that sense, but it doesn't mean that these that they're not politically connected to the ruling parties in the various countries that they uh, happen to be part of, and it doesn't mean that that the head of a central bank is not a political actor. Of course, he or she is. Um, in fact, they're some of the most powerful politicians on earth, really. Uh, they have several functions, one of which is monetary policy control, which is um, can be summarized by saying that they um, control the monetary base, MB, which is just the sum of all the credit that's outstanding and the amount in, in reserves. They also produce banknotes. Uh, this is the government revenue from printing money. is called senioraj. You take a 20 euro note. It's really just a piece of paper with someone's name on it. And, you know, again, they, they make 19 euros, 99 cents every time they print one off. They intervene in regulating foreign exchange markets. So, for example, um, if they want to hold a currency uh, peg, they can do that. They can also shut down foreign currency markets if they really, really want to. They can suspend convertibility. They can uh, devalue, devalue currencies, all kinds of stuff. Um, and that's they're, they're the agents of that interaction and regulation. They monitor financial risks. Um, they have a macroprudential role, which is very important, actually, um, especially uh, in the... Uh, Current period, especially uh, for for the ECB, which is currently I think hiring eight hundred economists or something like that to um, fill its macroprudential role. They actually operate the uh, the ECSB system, so this is the the credit transfer system that actually allows um, these banks to uh, interact. They manage the ECB's foreign reserves assets, and they do other things. Um, they define euro system policies. They actually implement these things. The central bank talks to banks, the bank talks to borrowers and depositors, and back again, okay? Uh, the ECB works closely with its national central banks. These guys do honestly have stuff to do. It's not like they're sitting around twiddling their thumbs waiting for the pension. They mediate with interbank lending. Um, central banks implement monetary policy by influencing the interest rate charged in that market. They, they, they can create uh, assets um, as they like. That's the, the, the brilliant thing about central banks. They work in Europe bond markets. They can influence the overnight rate for lending. You can just check out euribor.org for a bit more on that. And you can see here's the Fed funds rate since 1960. You can see this, it starts off pretty low, gets pretty high in the 1980s, drops right down to zero or very close to zero in the 2000s. The Fed is at what's called the zero lower bound um, for obvious reasons. And it's one of the reasons that people like Paul Krugman talk about the necessity for fiscal policy in these situations. So here's a simple uh, way to think about the amount of money in the system. Uh, the downward sloping uh, demand curve there is the demand for real balances. This is the demand for, for cash and, and deposits. The uh, fixed supply there is some amount M1. So you can think about just the amount of money in the system. And it's mediated by the rate of interest. So if the rate of interest is high, if it's up here, for example, um, that means that you won't demand that much money. You'll keep uh, most of your uh, wealth in bonds or loans or equities, stuff like that, you won't um, uh, choose to hold cash. If it's down here, very close to zero, which is, which is what it is today, then you'll demand quite a bit of cash. So this is a money demand with static money supply. The uh, central bank can uh, facilitate the, inc the increase or decrease of um, money by changing um, either the quantity of treasury bills, so issuing more treasury bills, okay, so moving out from Q1 to Q2. That increases the demand from D1 to D2, which changes the price. And of course, that changes uh, the interest rate here. 
they can do it the other way around as well. So they can purchase loads of treasury bills, reduce the supply if it wants, um, and uh, uh, change the interest rate uh, as well as it goes. And so the, the central bank, in a certain sense, has control over both sides of this market and neither in a certain um, particular sense. Here's the exact opposite, contractionary open market operation. The central bank feels the economy is kind of overheating, wants to reduce the money supply in the system. It can simply um, uh, change the interest rates and uh, uh, change the price of treasury bonds. Uh, and it works backwards as well. So here's the causal structure. In an expansionary open market operation, which is exactly what we have now, the central bank buys loads of treasury bills that causes the price of these bills to rise, that causes the short-term interest rate to fall, the public holds more money, less tree bills, thus having more cash to spend. A contractionary open market operation, they sell tree bills, prices fall, short-term interest rates rise, and the public holds less. So, nominal exchange rates. This is essentially the relative price of excuse me, one currency to another. The European euro appreciates relative to the yuan. Euro buys more yuan, and if it depreciates, it buys less. Don't get these two things mixed up. Exchange is important uh, determinant of inflation because of the small size and openness of Ireland in particular. So, for example, during the period of the sterling link, uh, the, the uh, link with the inflation rate of Ireland uh, tended to remain very close to the rate of the UK. And now, of course, all we care about is the euro. So what affects the exchange rate in the long run? Check out the Federal Reserve uh, link uh, there if you're interested in some more. So take a simple thing, like the domestic price level. If that goes up, then the exchange rate will go down. Uh, trade barriers, if you, if you increase trade barriers, then that causes the exchange rate to go up. If import demand goes up, then the exchange rate goes down. Export demand goes up, exchange rate goes up. Import productivity goes up. And the exchange rate goes up in the long run now, not in the short run. Real versus nominal exchange rates. So this is this tries to take account of price changes. So here essentially you get this Q measure, which is just the exchange rate of dollars for euros, and that you multiply that by the price level in euros and the price level in dollars. And uh, if purchasing power parity held, in other words, if it was the case that one um, burger in Ireland was the same price as a burger in the US, then that would be uh, multiplied by the exchange rate, of course, then that would be um, Q would be 1. PPP implies that the change in the relative exchange rates is equal to inflation. Okay, So if you take equation 62 there, which says the change in the exchange rate of the dollar or the euro, this is the percentage change, uh, that's just the percentage change in the price level in the US minus the percentage change in the price level in Europe, which is just the difference in inflation. Okay. Fly out something I'll talk about later, uncovered interest parity, changes in nominal exchange rates trigger shifts in exchange rates. So these are how these two things are connected. So, okay, what's a nominal effect of exchange rate? Well, this takes the idea of an exchange rate between two countries like, you know, the US and, and Europe, um, or the US and Saudi Arabia, and, and it essentially explodes that idea. Of course, Ireland doesn't trade with one country. It trades with many. So we need this multilateral exchange rate where we weight the each currency of each basket on its on the share of that currency's trade. Uh, we, we make it all relative to a base year. And we show the changes in the euro prices of this basket. And what it gives you is like an average. It tells you how these changes against all foreign currencies, on average, affect the euro or you know, Ireland's uh, trade, trade um, uh, stats. How do you calculate it? Well, again, it's a weighted average. So delta E over E, this, this exchange rate, um, is just the amount of trade in country 1 divided by the total amount of trade times the change in the exchange rate in country 1 divided by the exchange rate. And then you just keep doing that. No, most of the time, N is 12, um, but you can make it as big as you like in theory. Okay. How to think about this? Well, when you compare goods against and services against countries, obviously you use the exchange rate to compare prices. Changes in the exchange rate affect the relative price of goods across countries. Okay, So the appreciation of the home currency leads to an increase in the relative price of its import to exports to foreigners, 
and a decrease in the relative price of imports from abroad. Okay? A depreciation in the home currency leads to a decrease in the relative price of its imports to foreigners and an increase in the relative price of imports from abroad. So, which matters right now for Ireland? Just think about it. Fixed exchange rates. Um, when a country's exchange rate does not fluctuate at all, against some, or very little, in fairness, against a base currency over a sustained period of time, you have a fixed exchange rate. Ireland is in a fixed exchange rate regime with um, the other members of the Eurozone, but uh, we have also had um, what are called currency pegs um, uh, with other countries, for example, the UK. The policy implication of a fixed exchange rate means that when your uh, uh, currency appreciates, you need to get that thing back down to the peg. Um, so, for example, Latvia did that in 2010, the gold standard was all about that, and Ireland did it with the sterling peg. You need government intervention in the forex market to maintain a fixed exchange rate. That means that there's something against which the markets can bash, and they do from time to time. Um, and I'm going to talk about one in a little while. So floating exchange rates, well, this is obviously it fluctuates over time. The government makes very little attempt to peg the exchange rate against the base currency. And what that means is there's a lot more volatility in the exchange rate, implying appreciations and depreciations of the currency over time. Um, so in the 1990s, the UK um, exited the uh, European monetary system. This was a precursor to the EMU, where one tried to keep, if you're the policymaker, you tried to keep a corridor of exchange rates uh, going at all times. It completely collapsed because of massive speculation on the part of people like George Soros. Uh, and it, it, it was a, uh, a big blow to EMS at the time, or the European project at the time. So in forex markets, um, there's lots of different ways to look at foreign exchange markets. The spot, for example, where country A and B agree to trade one currency for another for a delivery on the spot, or if not country, but people A and B. Um, the spreads really matter, so the transaction costs. Forward markets really matter, um, where you price forex at different deliveries for hedging. Swaps, where you, you set the price today, but you swap back in the future. Futures and options, we talked about this a lot. And there's, a, there's many other ways to do it. Um, now, we need to talk about how arbitrage affects interest rates. If you have riskless arbitrage, in other words, I know for a fact that I can make a, a riskless profit somewhere, then an investor will cover the risk of the exchange rate ch changing the future by using a forward contract. This is if he knows the future really well. No exchange rate risk because there's no chance the exchange rate on the contract will change. This thing is called covered interest parity. Um, there wouldn't be a foreign exchange market really if this thing actually existed. Risky arbitrage, um, this is obviously closer to real life, um, you don't cover that risk, you invest according to the current and expect the future exchange rate. Things can be wrong, of course, you can be wrong, lots of things can go wrong, um, but since the future spot rate is not known, there's exchange rate risk and you're not covered against this risk. This is called uncovered interest parity, which I discussed earlier on in this lecture. So for example, the forward exchange rate, which is the price of forward contracts, the forward contracts allow investors holding deposits in foreign currencies to be certain about the future value of these deposits. There's no exchange rate risk in this future, and riskless arbitrage implies the rate of return on identical investments will generate the same rate of return. So if you find stuff like this, let me know. Now, the government, how the government kind of relates to all this is that if you buy and sell currencies in order to influence the prevailing exchange rate, you must have foreign exchange reserves. It's not likely very unlikely that a currency is going to have enough reserves to defend against massive and sustained attacks on the currency, um, where the markets just sell off. It's currency expected to be devalued. And um, we have several generations of currency crisis model with, which have to include this expectation of devaluation um, in their uh, calculus. What's really weird about this, you can actually borrow the currency you're attacking, pay it back after it's been devalued and make a fortune. So how does this story work? Well, there's a feedback effect. You know the money, de money supply and money demand interact exactly as, as I've described before. This obviously influences the price level, which changes the inflation rate, which affects the nominal interest rate via either uncovered interest parity or interest parity or via PPP, depending on what mechanism you want to use. And this affects money demand. So you can see there's a kind of a, 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 a chain of causality there. Um, I love this quote from Walter Badgett whose book Lombard Street should be required reading for anybody who wants to go into finance. Our credit system is much more delicate at some times than at others. Panics come according to a fixed rule. Every 10 years or so, we must have one of them. I love that quote. 
Okay, so there are three models of currency crises I want to discuss with you guys. One is a simple monetary flexible price model, which takes fixed exchange rates, output is assumed constant, and there's a token real side. Assume you've got some policymaker fella that wants to run budget deficits each period, such that delta D, the change in the deficit, is always positive. What you mean, what, which means that with fixed exchange rate plus money financing of a budget being totally unsustainable, the crisis in the currency is inevitable. Do you see any parallels with the Irish case here? The model asks, when and where does this crisis happen? So here's the model. Take the first equation here, which says that M, which is the money supply, minus P, the price level, is just alpha, which is a parameter, like 0.5 or something, times I, which is the interest rate. Uh, money supply is given by domestic assets held by the central bank plus uh, foreign reserves. That's the central bank's balance sheet. The uh, price level here is given by the exchange rate plus the price level uh, uh, you know, out foreign, as they say, P star. Uh, the in interest rate is given by uh, I star, which is the other country's interest rate, plus the change in the uh, exchange rate. That's uncovered interest parity. And we can say that the change in D, D dot, is given by mu. So what the government is doing is it's choosing this budget deficit. So this is our little model of how does it work. Well, what it tells you in this situation is that you can't simultaneously have fixed exchange rates and independent monetary policy and international convertible. You have to have two. Okay. Now in Ireland, obviously, we've picked fixed exchange rates and international capital mobility. We have given away our monetary policy. Other countries have chosen to have other things. You, three is impossible. The second generation says, well, okay, look, that's fine, but expectations and the policymakers' incentives play a key role in shaping policy that leads to the crisis. So if the policymaker finds up holding a peg really costly, and if a devaluation is suddenly expected, then there's a devaluation. There's a self-fulfilling, almost sunspot-like equilibrium. Okay? So that you've got to minimize a loss function, which says that you've got to pick this L, the smallest uh, loss you can, which is A, which is like, yet again, a parameter, times the optimal exchange rate star, minus the peg, plus B times the expected devaluation, plus C. The C is a massive cost, okay? So it's obviously zero if there's a devaluation and some massive value C if there is a devaluation. So this loss function doesn't look like a straight line. It's more like a staircase. And what you get is this weird multiple equilibria. Check out Woodford's 2003 paper linked on the website about this. Or self-fulfilling expectations and uh, odd prophecies. It's very difficult, but you often see uh, a problem of the coordination of market expectations in this situation, where um, you have a kind of a strange effect uh, over time, um, uh, which the long-term capital management debacle kind of fed into. So third-gen models, you've got to take account of a huge increase in financial globalization since the 60s. And really, and this, this literature is due to Krugman, show crises as balance sheet mismatches. So assume that owners of firms are the only investors, their investment depends on their net wealth, and firms are leveraged in partly in foreign currency. In other words, they borrow money from abroad. That means the balance sheet is affected by exchange rate changes. So we've got this really stripped down situation which shows that demand for goods, Y, is given by output Y, the interest rate, I, the expected price level over the actual price level, and then net exports, which is the expected price level, divided by uh, the price level times output. Money uh, supply is just an LM curve there, M over P is LYI. There's interest parity. Static expectations and risk neutrality, then what Krugman shows is that the real effect exchange rate affects demand through currency mismatches on investors' balance sheets for any given price. Okay, can you see the link with the bond um, uh, stuff we talked about in the last lecture. Okay, so that's our last lecture, uh, and I'm going to leave it there. Thank you very much.